Being a child rights perspective for the Tanzanian uh, pilot, I was uh, actually asked to say a few words on, on you because I think you have a very exciting background. So allow me just 30 seconds and then correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you mentioned some in your quick presentation, but uh, Dr. Lothar Kapman is a professor emeritus from Berlin University, and you mentioned that. But you're also a member uh, of the rapporteur of the CSC committee, uh, and you've been a member of the core leadership from the outset of, of, of this, of this uh, pilot, uh, from when it first started, uh, and a, a, a founding member of the General Comment 7 uh, uh, focal group. So I think that's very important to have that in mind. And please vote. Thanks for the friendly words of welcome. Honorable Madam Minister and distinguished audience. As you now know, I'm speaking on behalf of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the committee that monitors the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, to which the United Republic of Tanzania is a state party since June 1991. The United Republic is a committed member, is an active member, which has meanwhile submitted four reports on the implementation of child rights to the committee. That's a <laughs> Two reports under the convention, and also the two initial reports to the optional protocols to the convention. Four, all two. And my first responsibility is to convey to you, Honorable Madam Minister, the best wishes and the high appreciation of the chair of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, Professor Yang Yi Li. And the entire committee has asked me to extend its best. We are full of sincere gratitude for the cooperation and support of the Minister so generously and effectively offered to the International Task Group, which today wraps up its pilot project here in Tanzania. This task group, commissioned by the UN Committee, has developed a set of indicators that shall help governments everywhere in the world, in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, Asia, Pacific region, to assess the conditions of life and development of young children in that country. The group needed the reality of the country in order to test whether the set of indicators constructed at the desks of the researchers at home can prove its worth in practice. That's the reason why we came here into a country to test our indicators. You, Honorable Madam Minister, reacted immediately to our letter of inquiry by a friendly invitation to start the first pilot study here in Tanzania. And now we are at the end of a very productive examination of this indicator instrument. And thanks to you, and also thanks to dedicated officers from ministries and other governmental services, UNICEF, its representatives and officers, and numerous helpful collaborators of many other groups impressively involved in children's well-being and development of young groups. I would like to add that the committee and the others engaged in these activities had good reason to hope for an open door 
as we knew that in the United Republic of Tanzania at that time, when we sent the letter, was in the final <coughs> stage of adopting a Children's Act, which demonstrates that Tanzania is determined to give children their value and development a central place in policy. The committee was very pleased to hear that the final step was done on November 4 last year and sends again a sincere congratulations. Oh, Please allow me to say some sentences about why this indicator project is of such a high importance for the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Several years ago, we became aware that in the dialogues with state parties, early childhood was addressed from a very narrow angle of the view only. Child and maternal mortality, malnutrition, immunization, of course, issues and problems of extremely high relevance. However, the dialogues disregarded that meanwhile a growing body of evidence had demonstrated that the course for personality development in all its aspects is set in the first years of life. Early childhood provides windows of opportunity which may and should not be missed. Economists tell us that every investment in early childhood will be abundantly repaid to the individual and to society. Unfortunately, the Convention on the Rights of the Child explicitly says almost nothing about the rights of young children. Of young children. The drafters of the Convention were of the opinion that all provisions of the Convention hold for young children as well, but did not detail what has to be provided specifically for children in the first years of life. Thus, the committee decided to write what is called a general comment, an explanation of the rights of the Convention with regard to young children. Their protection, good and reliable relationships, incentives of love, play facilities, appropriate education, right to be heard and to be respected as young members of their social group and of society. So presented in the committee's general comment number seven, which was highly welcomed by the entire child rights community, by UNICEF, <coughs> by WHO, UNESCO, and other child rights oriented organizations. But is still not enough known by many who were for children and who were with children. There are several ways to make the messages better known. A first example is a dissemination campaign, which the committee started together with the Early Childhood Commission of Jamaica. A group of experienced caregivers, social workers, and parents from the country, from Jamaica, adapted the general comment to the situation of young children in urban and rural Jamaica and developed training courses which were attended by many caregivers, kindergarten teachers, and others involved with young children. Another way to use the committee's general comment is the approach which is presented here to me. The construction of indicators which show to which extent young children can enjoy the rights highlighted in general comment number seven. The committee hopes that this diagnostic instrument 
will help to clearly identify progress made and also find the groups of young children who deserve special attention. And from many hopes that such data will provide information for governments and their ministries to design targeted measures and action plans so that also these children can develop, be educated, and participate in social and cultural life like all the other children. And also the community hopes that regional follow-up collections of such data will support government's intentions to better control the results of such efforts. All the information which was collected during the past months here in Tanzania is in your hands, Honorable Madam Minister. The task group and also the committee would be delighted if the material is of use for you. I know that the task group would like to provide additional information and explanation if needed for further analysis and exercises. The task group itself will use the results of this pilot study to make the indicators still more handy and still more easy to be used so that after some more piloting, the indicator set can be made available to all governments which are interested. The committee will furthermore recommend state funds to integrate these indicators into their data collection system in order to facilitate reporting and information. We so much would like to simplify the reporting process. And here now we have a tool which brings us closer to the same. Madam Minister, today we are celebrating a milestone in the development of the early childhood in the <laughs> Once more, sincere thanks of the Committee on the Rights of the Child for your highly appreciated support. Thank you. Thank you. We have for a minute to get a couple of minutes. Yeah, we will. We will. Yeah. part of the day because after years of sitting and listening to other people introduce Dr. Clyde Hertzman, I finally had the moment I was waiting for. I've been assigned to introduce Dr. Clyde Hertzman to you. Uh, Clyde is a world-renowned early child development expert. He has a passion for children and bedroom children's lives. He is a professor from the University of British Columbia who has founded the Human Early Learning Partnership, which is now designated Global Knowledge Hub for Early Child Development, the Center of Excellence for Early Child Development. Clyde has been a core member of the leadership team of this project, and his effort and his enthusiasm, along with other members such as Lothar and few other members and Louis Semani who is here with us today from Consultative Group and few other members from WHI UNICEF has brought this project to the day, to the place and the point that it is today. Uh, so Clyde is going to share with us some uh, uh, point of views uh, from the point of ECD and early child development and what does this pilot mean to in terms of early child development. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back. Thank you. Madam Minister and uh, honored guests, it's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here for me as well today. Uh, as Lothar said, this is a milestone. It's a very important milestone. And what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to walk you through seven points that I think will help uh, 
build some bridges of understanding here. Um, the first is that I'd like to add some pieces of history to the history that you've, you've already heard about this process. And that is that um, when the Human Early Learning Partnership was asked to be the global knowledge hub on early child development for the World Health Organization's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, we were then asked to explain why an international commission on social determinants of health should care about early child development. And our answer, which they bought and they published in their report a year and a half ago, was that early development, that is to say early physical development, early social and emotional development, and early language and cognitive development, all have a lifelong impact on health, well-being, learning, and behavior. And moreover, the state of physical social, emotional, and language and cognitive development in the early years is fundamentally dependent on the qualities of stimulation, support, nurturance, and participation that young children have. So the social environment <coughs> determines the state of physical, social, emotional, and language and cognitive development, and it goes on to strongly influence health, well-being, learning, and behavior across the balance of the life course. Now, while we were doing that work for the WHO, we were asking ourselves, well, when the commission is done, how do we keep this process going? How do we promote a global conversation about this issue? And that was the point at which me, as somebody who comes out of population and public health and out of child development, discovered the possibilities of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and in particular, general comment number seven. By the time we were finishing our work for the World Health Organization, Lothar and Alan Kikuchi White and others were finishing their pilot on, the, uh, on GC7 in Jamaica. And one way or another, we found each other. And what that meant was is that we were building a bridge between people who are traditional content people who care about the content of early child development and public health and so forth with people who have been traditionally on the right side. And so we formed together an ad hoc group. We went uh, at the end of 2005 to the Committee on the Rights of the Child that both are sits on and asked the committee chair to give us a note of concurrence to produce an indicator set. So in early 2006, we received that. And then from 2006 through to May of 2008, we worked together. We met together half a dozen times, and we hashed things out, and we went out for consultation, etc. And during that time, we had to cross cultures. Because the traditional legal culture <coughs> is about procedural rights. It's about, you know, hitting kids or not hitting kids. It's about if parents divorce, what opportunities do children have to speak? Whereas for people who are interested in development, we're interested in all of the things that will improve physical, social, emotional, and language and cognitive development. And so that there was a culture that needed to be bridged there. And I'm happy to say in that two years plus, we bridged it. So that when we went back to the committee in the spring of 2008, we had a set of indicators. And they gave us another letter of concurrence that said, OK, go out and pilot them. So that period from then through to the time that we came to you was involved with creating uh, a manual to be able to explain how to do this. So that what we're dealing with here then is a very, very important bridge between the content areas of early child development and the, the, the notion of children's rights. So that's the first point. The second point is that when you think about physical and social, emotional, and language and cognitive development, those kind of things, they are the sort of things which don't improve overnight. If they're going to improve, they're going to improve gradually over time. And that is recognized in the international law as <coughs> substantive rights. So to say that children have a right for their capacities to evolve, which is what GC7 says, is not to say that we can snap our fingers and make it happen tomorrow. What it's saying is that over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we want to be going in a direction that today is better than yesterday and tomorrow is better than today. So progressive realization. And the only way you can 
you can be true to progressive realization is by having a set of indicators that you can measure consistently over time and say whether or not you're going in the right direction or not. So the indicators and the notion of progressive realization are all bound up with one another. Right? And that's why the indicators are so important. Third thing here, and this comes to something that, that Lothar mentioned earlier on, that at the same time that we're embarking on creating indicators for what is a subset of the entire convention, the committee in Geneva is drowning in 600 page reports from countries. Long, long, long reports. Right? And so somehow or another, what we have to do is help things to become more systematic and to focus more on what is known and what is not known in a way that will communicate efficiently. Right? And so part of the idea then of having the flow schemes, the way they were set up, was to take a very, very complex endeavor break it down into 16 indicators and flow through from structure to uh, uh, activity to outcomes so that uh, you could reduce, in a sense, the complex thing to a series of yes and no and somewhere between yes and no answers along with quality documentation. Right? And with that then, it raises point number four, that we can in fact get better quality information but it can be more succinct at the same time. So it can be shorter and it can be better at the same time. So that's point number four. Point number five is what I'm going to call the problem of success. When we first came here, we didn't know what was going to happen. When Ziba first came in February 2009, it wasn't clear that she would find a receptive country, but she did. When we came back in September of 2009, when CredPro was doing its work to try to recruit a team, it wasn't clear that we could recruit a team. But within three weeks of that, a team was in place. When we came back in December 2009 to train the team, it wasn't clear that the people would show up, but they did. It wasn't clear that they would find it stimulating, but they did. And so we went on to the next step. And the next step was for everybody, with us 10,000 kilometers away, to go through the whole uh, indicator process to give feedback on whether it made sense. And so by the end of January, we knew, yeah, it made sense. We made some changes, but it made sense. And then the big test was, would people actually go out and do the work in the 16 teams that had been created and bring material together so one could say whether or not the tool could be used for the purpose. And not only was the answer to that yes, it was done on time, and indeed, 160 documents were brought forward to document all the things that Tanzania is trying to do, is doing, and is benefiting from that. So that was stunning. Three months, start to finish, well done. Right? So this was, this then, becomes the problem of success. Because when we came here to begin with, we didn't see beyond the point of finding out whether the tool worked or not. And but now we know the tool can work. And now all of this information has been collected. So now there's the question of actually using the information. Okay? And so I think I want to say two last things. One is that as this thing goes forward around the world, because of what's happened here, it will be, in effect, the Tanzanian protocol. And I'm hoping that we will come to use a term like that, so that the Tanzanian <coughs> stamp will be on this, and people will understand that the fundamental validation was done here in Tanzania. But the other part, then, is that this now has meaning for your reporting cycle. We were talking about that this morning at UNICEF. Uh, and, um, I want to point out that copies of the face sheets of all of the documents, all 160 or so documents, that were found in the process of the monitoring are here and available and will be turned over uh, to the ministry so that that starting point for actually the, the, the full-on report writing um, has been established. And with that, I'd just like to thank you very much again. And
think that was uh, uh, three presentations setting the scene for now looking at the results. We will have a little uh, break to exchange views, to stretch legs, and we've pushed a little bit for coffee. You might have to wait a few minutes, but I think we can we can go for coffee now. And uh, I think that's eight for 15, 20 minutes from now. So if we could resume again, uh, 20, 25 past three. Is that okay then? Please, your coffee will be served just outside, and they'll be back here again, 20, 25 past three.